be very persevering, reject all past experience, and do not listen to reason. Oh yes, a final piece of advice. Never magnetize before inquisitive persons. Another eye-opener was Martin Gardner's Fads and Fallacies in the Name of Science. Here was Wilhelm Reich uncovering the key to the structure of galaxies in the energy of the human orgasm. Andrew Cross creating microscopic insects electrically from salts. Hans Hürbicher under Nazi aegis announcing that the Milky Way was made not of stars but of snowballs. Charles Piazzi Smith discovering in the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza a world chronology from the creation to the second coming. L. Ron Hubbard writing a manuscript able to drive its readers insane. Was it ever proofed, I wondered? The Bridie Murphy case, which led millions into concluding that at last there was serious evidence of reincarnation. Joseph Rhine's demonstrations of ESP, appendicitis cured by cold water enemas, bacterial diseases by brass cylinders, and gonorrhea by green light. And amid all these accounts of self-deception and charlatanry, to my surprise, a chapter on UFOs. Of course, merely by writing books cataloguing spurious beliefs, Mackay and Gardner came across, at least a little, as grumpy and superior. Was there nothing they accepted? Still, it was stunning how many passionately argued and defended claims to knowledge had amounted to nothing. It slowly dawned on me that, human fallibility being what it is, there might be other explanations for flying saucers. I had been interested in the possibility of extraterrestrial life from childhood, from long before I ever heard of flying saucers. I've remained fascinated long after my early enthusiasm for UFOs waned, as I understood more about that remorseless taskmaster called the scientific method. Everything hinges on the matter of evidence. On so important a question, the evidence must be airtight. The more we want it to be true, the more careful we have to be. No witnesses say so is good enough. People make mistakes. People play practical jokes. People stretch the truth for money, or attention, or fame. People occasionally misunderstand what they're seeing. People sometimes even see things that aren't there. Essentially, all the UFO cases were anecdotes, something asserted. UFOs were described variously as rapidly moving or hovering, disc-shaped, cigar-shaped, or ball-shaped, moving silently or noisily, with a fiery exhaust or with no exhaust at all accompanied by flashing lights, or uniformly glowing with a silvery cast, or self-luminous. The diversity of the observations hinted that they had no common origin, and that the use of such terms as UFOs or flying saucers served only to confuse the issue by grouping generically a set of unrelated phenomena. There was something odd about the very invention of the phrase flying saucer. As I write this chapter, I have before me a transcript of an April 7, 1950 interview between Edward R. Murrow, the celebrated CBS newsman, and Kenneth Arnold, a civilian pilot who saw something peculiar near Mount Rainier in the state of Washington on June 24, 1947, and who, in a way, coined the phrase. Arnold claims that the newspapers did not quote me properly. When I told the press, they misquoted me. And in the excitement of it all, one newspaper and another one got it so ensnarled up that nobody knew just exactly what they were talking about. These objects more or less fluttered like they were, oh, I'd say, boats on very rough water. And when I described how they flew, I said that they flew like they take a saucer and throw it across the water. Most of the newspapers misunderstood and misquoted that, too. They said that I said that they were saucer-like. I said that they flew in a saucer-like fashion. Arnold thought he saw a train of nine objects, one of which produced a terrific blue flash. He concluded they were a new kind of winged aircraft. Murrow summed up. That was an historic misquote. While Mr. Arnold's original explanation has been forgotten, the term flying saucer has become a household word. Kenneth Arnold's flying saucers looked and behaved quite differently from what in only a few years would be rigidly particularized in the public understanding of the term something like a very large and highly manoeuvrable frisbee. Most people honestly reported what they saw, but what they saw were natural, if unfamiliar, phenomena. Some UFO sightings turned out to be unconventional aircraft, conventional aircraft with unusual lighting patterns, high-altitude balloons, luminescent insects, planets seen under unusual atmospheric conditions, optical mirages, and looming lenticular clouds 
ball lightning, sun dogs, meteors, including green fireballs, and satellites, nose cones, and rocket boosters spectacularly re-entering the atmosphere. There are so many artificial satellites up there that they're always making garish displays somewhere in the world. Two or three decay every day in the Earth's atmosphere, the flaming debris often visible to the naked eye. Just conceivably, however, a few of these displays might be small comets dissipating in the upper air. At least some radar reports were due to anomalous propagation, radio waves traveling curved paths due to atmospheric temperature inversions. Traditionally, they were also called radar angels, something that seems to be there but isn't. You could have simultaneous visual and radar sightings without there being any there there. When we notice something strange in the sky, some of us become excitable and uncritical, bad witnesses. There was the suspicion that the field attracted rogues and charlatans. Many UFO photos turned out to be fakes, small models hanging by thin threads, often photographed in a double exposure. A UFO seen by thousands of people at a football game turned out to be a college fraternity prank. A piece of cardboard, some candles, and a thin plastic bag that dry cleaning comes in, all cobbled together to make a rudimentary hot air balloon. The original crashed saucer account, with the little alien men and their perfect teeth, turned out to be a straight-out hoax. Frank Scully, columnist for Variety, passed on a story told by an oilman friend. It played a central dramatic role in Scully's best-selling 1950 book, Behind the Flying Saucers. Sixteen dead aliens from Venus, each three feet high, had been found in one of three crashed saucers. Booklets with alien pictograms had been recovered. The military was covering up. The implications were profound. The hoaxers were Silas Newton, who said he used radio waves to prospect for gold and oil, and a mysterious Dr. G, who turned out to be a Mr. Gebauer. Newton produced a gear from the UFO machinery and flashed close-up saucer photos, but he did not allow close inspection. When a prepared skeptic, through sleight of hand, switched gears and sent the alien artifact away for analysis, it turned out to be made of kitchen pot aluminum. The crashed saucer scam was a small interlude in a quarter century of frauds by Newton and Gebauer, chiefly selling worthless oil leases and prospecting machines. In 1952, they were arrested by the FBI, and the following year found guilty of conducting a confidence game. Their exploits, chronicled by the historian Curtis Peebles, ought to have made UFO enthusiasts cautious forever about crashed saucer stories from the American Southwest around 1950. No such luck. On October 4, 1957, Sputnik 1, the first Earth-orbiting artificial satellite, was launched. Of 1,178 recorded UFO sightings in America that year, 701, or 60 percent, rather than the 25 percent you'd expect, occurred between October and December. The clear implication is that Sputnik and its attendant publicity somehow generated UFO reports. Perhaps people were looking at the night sky more, and saw more natural phenomena they didn't understand? Or could it be they looked up more and saw more of the alien spacecraft that are there all the time? The idea of flying saucers had dubious antecedents, tracing back to a conscious hoax entitled I Remember Lemuria, written by Richard Shaver and published in the March 1945 number of the pulp fiction periodical Amazing Stories. It was exactly the sort of stuff I devoured as a child, Lost continents were settled by space aliens 150,000 years ago, I was informed, leading to the creation of a race of demonic underground beings responsible for human tribulations and the existence of evil. The editor of the magazine, Ray Palmer, who was, like the subterranean beings he warned about, roughly four feet high, promoted the notion, well before Arnold's sighting, that the Earth is being visited by disc-shaped alien spacecraft and that the government is covering up its knowledge and complicity. Merely from the newsstand covers of such magazines, millions of Americans were exposed to the idea of flying saucers well before the term was coined. All in all, the alleged evidence seemed thin, most often devolving into gullibility, hoax, hallucination, misunderstanding of the natural world, hopes and fears disguised as evidence, and a craving for attention, fame, and fortune. Too bad, I remember thinking. Since then, I've been lucky enough to be involved in sending spacecraft to other planets to look for life, and in listening for possible radio signals from alien civilizations, if any, on planets of distant stars. We've had a few tantalizing moments. But if the suspected signal isn't available for every grumpy skeptic to pick over, 
we cannot call it evidence of extraterrestrial life, no matter how appealing we find the notion. We'll just have to wait until, if such a time ever comes, better data are available. We've not yet found compelling evidence for life beyond the Earth. We're only at the very beginning of the search, though. New and better information might emerge, for all we know, tomorrow. I don't think anyone could be more interested than I am in whether we're being visited. It would save me so much time and effort to be able to study extraterrestrial life directly and nearby, rather than at best indirectly and at a great distance. Even if the aliens are short, dour, and sexually obsessed, if they're here, I want to know about them. How modest our expectations are about aliens, and how shoddy the standards of evidence that many of us are willing to accept, can be found in the saga of the crop circles. Originating in Great Britain and spreading throughout the world was something surpassing strange. Farmers or passers-by would discover circles, and in later years much more complex pictograms, impressed upon fields of wheat, oats, barley, and rapeseed. Beginning with simple circles in the middle 1970s, the phenomenon progressed year by year, until by the late 1980s and early 1990s, the countryside, especially in southern England, was graced by immense geometrical figures, some the size of football fields, imprinted on cereal grain before the harvest, circles tangent to circles, or connected by axes, parallel lines drooping off, insectoids, some of the patterns showed a central circle surrounded by four symmetrically placed smaller circles. Clearly, it was concluded, caused by a flying saucer and its four landing pods. A hoax? Impossible, almost everyone said. There were hundreds of cases. It was done sometimes in only an hour or two in the dead of night, and on such a large scale. No footprints of pranksters leading towards or away from the pictograms could be found. And besides, what possible motive could there be for a hoax? Many less conventional conjectures were offered. People with some scientific training examined sites, spun arguments, instituted whole journals devoted to the subject. Were the figures caused by strange whirlwinds called columnar vortices? Or even stranger ones called ring vortices? What about ball lightning? Japanese investigators tried to simulate in the laboratory and on a small scale the plasma physics they thought was working its way on far-off Wiltshire. But especially as the crop figures became more complex, meteorological or electrical explanations became more strained. Plainly, it was due to UFOs, the aliens communicating to us in a geometrical language. Or perhaps it was the devil, or the long-suffering earth complaining about the depredations visited upon it by the hand of man. New Age tourists came in droves. All-night vigils were undertaken by enthusiasts equipped with audio recorders and infrared vision scopes. Print and electronic media from all over the world tracked the intrepid seriologists. Best-selling books on extraterrestrial crop disorders were purchased by a breathless and admiring public. True, no saucer was actually seen settling down on the wheat, no geometrical figure was filmed in the course of being generated, but dowsers authenticated their alien origin and channelers made contact with the entities responsible. Orgone energy was detected within the circles. Questions were asked in Parliament. The royal family called in for special consultation Lord Solly Zuckerman, former principal scientific adviser to the Ministry of Defence. Ghosts were said to be involved, also the Knights Templar of Malta and other secret societies. Satanists were implicated. The Defence Ministry was covering the matter up. A few inept and inelegant circles were judged attempts by the military to throw the public off the track. The tabloid press had a field day. The Daily Mirror hired a farmer and his son to make five circles in hope of tempting a rival tabloid, the Daily Express, into reporting the story. The Express was, in this case at least, not taken in. Seriological organizations grew and splintered. Competing groups sent each other intimidating doggerel. Accusations were made of incompetence or worse. The number of crop circles rose into the thousands. The phenomenon spread to the United States, Canada, Bulgaria, Hungary, Japan, the Netherlands. The pictograms, especially the more complex...